Hey, Calvary. This is Patrick Sebecki here on The Weekly, helping to connect the Sunday at Calvary to your Monday through Saturday. I'm here today with Jake Bauer, and I'm so excited. This is actually the last weekly we'll be doing for the summer. We're going to take a break through July and August and come back with Jay Ewing hosting again once he's back from sabbatical. So I'm excited to continue talking to Jake today and honestly been looking forward to this conversation all month. As always, if you're looking for more information, you can go to calvarybible.com. You can hit the location that's closest to you and hear about what's going on at Calvary this summer. So Jake, how are you doing today? I'm doing all right. It's been a crazy morning, but glad to be here with you and uh, it's fun to be on the weekly. Oh man, it's been so fun. This is the third time you're on this summer and I've just been so grateful to have these conversations with you. And now I'm excited to actually have a conversation with you after you've preached on a Sunday morning. I know this somewhat ironic that this is the last one I'm having. It's the first one where I've preached. <laughs> no, it's so good. Honestly, it's the perfect end to the, to, to the summer. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Yeah. I just so enjoyed your message on Galatians 5. I think just where it landed in the series has been really sweet. You're answering this question. What is it what does it look like to be in relationship with the triune God that we've been talking about the last few weeks? And you were in Galatians five talking about the fruit of the spirit. And I, I even just some of the things that you said, I think the illustration of not gratifying the desires of the flesh with like the difference your lacrosse coach would feel if you had actually punched a guy versus just (laughs) telling him you wanted to punch a guy was just such a helpful thing to be like, Oh yes. That like, that is such a helpful category to have of they are different. There is a different level and we can fight those desires. Well, yeah, I I actually wrestled through that a little bit because one thing I didn't want to say was that our desires don't change because they do. Um, and I, I do think, you know, even transformed by the renewing of our minds Mm. and a new heart created me a clean heart. And so there are, uh, categories in scripture clearly where our desires and our passions change the way we think about things change that we want what God wants more and more. And yet a condition for being in the spirit is not that we are fleshless or mm. not that we have no fleshly desires. That's really what I wanted to communicate there was that yeah. um, when we stand before God, like we're denying the desires. That's the primary thing we're doing and that he's conforming us the closer we walk with him to want what he wants in the same ways. And so, I don't know, just a thought on that was that, that that's a interesting yeah. tension, you know, in the Christian life. Totally. I think it's even like we start wanting to want what God wants. Yes. <laughs> like that's more often yeah. the case in just my own life, my own heart. And then it, is been just the journey of, and actually I've been helped a lot by some great theologians who have applied good brain science to this. Mm -hmm. I think of like the book freedom fight is one example. I think that where they use this really well talking about how we just have these patterns of thought that are actually just a part of our, the structure of our brain and changing that takes work, but it actually does change and it actually reformats the structure of our brain so that I mean, the way I've been talking about it with students this summer is the first time you make a new choice, it's like walking through the jungle with a machete. Mm. It's difficult, like you can do it, but it's, it's hard. But the more you make that choice, the easier and the clearer that path becomes until it becomes the easiest path for you to take. That's great. Yeah, I the, really like that. Yeah, the hard part is, all of the easy clear paths when we first become a Christian are the ones that are the desires of the flesh. Yeah. It's all. And you see in people's lives who become transformed by the gospel, something really similar. There is a reality where the longer you are a prodigal, the more difficult it is just logistically mm-hmm. to come back into the church. And I don't, Never impossible. God's grace goes to the deepest areas of sin in our lives. But the more choices you make, the more that you go down a path that is full of sin or that is uh, deep in the depths of your own sin, 
it, it can oftentimes be really, really complicated and logistically difficult to get back into the church. And, and what I specifically mean is you just break more bridges. You you mm. burn more uh, bridges with relationships or even with, you know, like there, there's serious consequences to certain sins, just in an earthly sense to our bodies or whatever else. And um, that's just true. And yet there is, you know, his grace still abounds yeah. all the more and helps us. But there is a sense where it's the more good choices you make that are in line with the will of God, the easier it is to stay on that path. The more poor choices you make that are in line with the flesh, the harder it is in some senses to um, come back from that or, or the, just the more friction there is in that. Wow. Yeah, just even having a good category for thinking about how humans actually change for the long term mm-hmm. is that, yeah, it's not this like shock and then you just use your will to power through all these obstacles and all these things that are totally new and totally foreign. I think of even just the, I just talk with so many students and college and high school students, honestly, about the practice of reading their Bible every day. Just getting time with the Lord every day is such a struggle. And it's, I I think it's just a struggle because it's something you don't do. And I even talk about how like it's, this is, this can be easy and you can give yourself ways to go about this. So like I talk about the seven minute quiet time is like one of my favorite things because everyone has seven minutes in their day. And I actually recommend to people who are doing it for the first time. I was like, you should actually like time yourself, like take one minute and pray and then take three minutes to read scripture, take two minutes to apply it to your life and then take one minute to pray and use only seven minutes, but do it every single day because then you get to a point where I, this is just something I decided to do after once I became a Christian in college and now opening the word, getting time with the Lord, praying, it it just comes so much more easily to me and it's just easier to slot into my schedule because I've been making intentional time for it all these years, but it started with seven minutes. And frankly, a lot of that seven minutes was like the middle of the day between classes. And I remembered that I hadn't done it that morning. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's so great. And I'm thinking about, I think one of the biggest responses that I see from people and why it's hard to get into the scriptures is that they just don't see change. Or they don't, you know, it doesn't feel like it's actually long-term transforming things for them. It doesn't feel like, well, I didn't get anything out of it this morning. Or I don't feel like I'm getting anything out of it. I I feel dry. And first off, sympathize with that. I understand. I've been there and have read scripture before and walked away and gone, what what, what was the point of that? But I read something recently in a book um, that I thought was very helpful. Basically. What was the book? Is Word Smithy by Doug Wilson. Um, but that, that is the book, not a huge Doug Wilson reader, but this one, this one was really helpful. And one of the things he says in it is, uh, basically the things that transform us the most in life are the things we don't remember. And so he uses the illustration of infancy and says, we are the most formulated in the first five years of our lives. That's what sets up in some ways uh, large parts of who we'll be and who we'll grow into and how much do you remember from the first five years of your life. And one of the things he says in there is if we're reading for retention all the time and that's our one qualifier for is this shaping me, is this forming me, and our goal is to read for retention just to retain information, he's like you're going to feel like your reading is a failure. You're going to feel like oh man, I just don't remember every page of that book I read or I don't remember every concept that came out of that. And he goes, you are being shaped by the process of reading, not by simply the things that you remember. And Mm -hmm. I thought that was a really helpful way to think about reading the Bible where I go, sure, maybe on any given morning, you're not going to wake up and go, this is transforming exactly how life is going to go for me today. But it's the long-term daily coming back and returning consistency to the scriptures that shapes us and molds us into people. And it's 
20 years down the road, you're going to look back and go, wow, who was I when I started? You know, who, who was I when I started reading the Bible and how has that shaped the trajectory of my life? I mean, honestly, that's the way I feel. I think I, I know I'm in a different category compared to a lot of people at Calvary who grew up in Christian homes and have been believers their whole lives. I I get that. But honestly, I think I, my Tina and I have this joke about who I was as a 19 year old. And it's just like freshman Patrick is like a different person than (laughs) than like anyone else that I have been. And so, and, and she'll quote, there's a great quote from the meaning of marriage by Tim Keller about how, uh, you never marry, uh, you're never married to the same person who was at your wedding. Wow. Um, because you you and your spouse change over time, probably change each other. Totally. Yeah. But, and, and he's tackling this idea of like, people have this expectation of marriage of like, this is the person I love. This is the person I want to spend my life with. And then a few years down the road, that person changes and it's really hard. And that's actually the source of a lot of divorce conflict Mm. and he's arguing that well you shouldn't have expected that person to stay the same like you can't even expect that of yourself and so it's interesting he's almost arguing the flip side of like he like we're you're going to change inevitably as a person Mm. so how are you going to change yeah and that's not a question he deals with in the meaning of marriage but i think it's a great question even thinking like okay if the fruits of the spirit are fruit Sorry. Thank Sing- you. Thank singular you. Singular there there fruit of the spirit. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. I, I, I had to change that category in my mind as I was studying this passage because mm. it, it is, it just slips out, you know, where it's the fruits of the spirit. I love to, but it's just not in there, you know? Yeah. It is, it is singular. And even I just think the picture I use when I introduce the seven minute quiet time is actually just from John 15, um, where Jesus is talking about how he's divine where the branch is. Um, and I, and you know this, but I, I grew up around a vineyard. That's just what my dad does. Um, and he, and we would talk about how, if you didn't have some way to structure the vine and the branches, a wire for the branches to hang on or a pole or, a even a trellis is a, it's a square lattice work that the vine can climb up. You would just have a weed on the ground. That would never bear fruit. <laughs> and so what what you need is that structure for the vine to grow up and for to hang. And then actually after a few years, it'll be there by itself. Yeah. Like it, it's strong enough and supportive enough that it doesn't need the structure anymore, but it required the structure at first to bear fruit. Yeah. I, I mentioned to you, I'm reading <clears throat> Dallas Willard's Spiritual Disciplines of the Christian life right now. And it's an older book. It's a huge one in kind of the conversation about spiritual disciplines. And um, one of the illustrations, I guess, analogies he's using is he says, we see the decision moments that Jesus makes in the four gospels. We see the times where he's put on the spot to uh, make a spirit filled decision. We see when, a blind person comes up to him and they're the outcast of society and he treats them with compassion rather than neglects them. And so we see these huge radical moments of Jesus's life and he goes, and then we analyze our, our entire lives, the day to day living part portions of our lives based off of those moments. And, and 30 years is a long time. There's no chance we're seeing all of what Jesus is doing. And, but we have allusions to the day to day structure of Jesus's life. And Dallas Willard basically says, why do we expect to produce the acts that Jesus produces in those on the spot moments? If we don't have the systems in our lives that create the kind of person who does those acts. And so he, he talks about the spiritual disciplines in that sense where he goes like, it's not, it's the disciplines, the day-to-day, minute-by-minute living of our lives that shapes us into the people who can make the right decision. Mm -hmm. It's not those moments that make us the people who make good decisions. You know, it's not the -the on-the-spot moments. I I love that way of thinking about the disciplines where I go, okay, Jesus lived in a body. He he lived in in a body in a real-life sense. He experienced the minute-by-minute walking, conversations, meals, and 
in those times, what what did he do? He prayed without ceasing. He meditated on the scriptures. He he spent solitude time alone with God, and that was building him into the kind of person who, in decision moments, was made, like he learned obedience through what he suffered. He he came in and he learned what it was to be obedient through earthly life. So, anyways, that was a really cool category for me to think through. Okay, what am I doing every day that's going to make me in those moments? a follower of Christ. Yeah. I think of even, uh, we were joking at John Mark Comer is like, he's just Dallas Willard, but he's a younger guy who's preaching now. Dallas Willard on podcast. Yep. <laughs> so good. And he even talks about how do you build a lifestyle that leads you to being a person like Jesus? Like, are you actually willing to give up some of the American dream, the American culture things? the the busyness, the urgency, the overscheduling to actually be someone that can have peace and patience and like just be able to be like Jesus. Yeah. And I, it's it he has a really challenging uh he has some great great things to say about it that are really challenging for us of like we just live in a really high achievement, high winning culture and even just something I've noticed with students of like in discussions, it will either be there's, there's quiet because they're afraid to say something wrong or they're not paying attention. That happens. <laughs> <laughs> or it's over talking in the hopes of like saying enough to get the right thing. And it's like, Oh man, I feel like that's so many of the categories people fall into is like, Either I'm going to like do the bare minimum and show up and then I won't fail because I'm not standing out or I'm just going to push and push and push hoping that I've done enough to succeed. Yeah. It's like, Oh, what, what is like, I don't think that's what the Lord calls us to. Yeah. Solomon mentioned in his sermon on Galatians five, I listened to it. And if you haven't yet, it's, it's a good one. Um, so that Brody preached at the Thorn campus. This is amazing too. So, Solomon mentioned on <clears throat> Sunday that if we expect the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, one of the things we need to do is spend time with the Spirit. Like if we expect uh, to be people who produce spiritual fruit, we need to engage with the Spirit who is in us. And that's some of what you're saying is um, in, or- in order for us to have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control in our lives, we need to be people who foremost are um, engaging with the spirit who produces these things. If we're just like, you know what, the next time that someone hurts, hurts me or whatever, I'm going to be Mm. self-controlled and it's a personal resolution, which sometimes works. It it does sometimes works, but in the short term, in the short term, but to build a person who is defined by these things means Mm. to spend time with the spirit and to listen to his voice in our lives and to, um, meditate with him. So I, I love that, that. That is really the core of these fruit as they come, which is what I said in the sermon, that they, they come from God. They're from God. And if we want to see them in our lives, we need to spend time with this God. Yeah. Even just the, that a real love isn't built in a moment. I think, I think there's, there can be an infatuation in a moment that can be shattered, but a real love. And I, I think this is the beauty of like, wedding vows of um, it. I would say it CS Lewis has this idea that duty obligation is a crutch to love because you want, you want to love your spouse in all the ways that they honestly, you feel like they deserve. You want to, and you know, at the same time, you are not going to love them in all those ways. And so what it often becomes, and I think this is this applies really well to even just spending time with God, even when it doesn't feel like anything is happening, is like, but I know, I know it is good for me to be spending time with God, even if I don't feel the love that I want. But I know that one day, because I spent this time, I will actually be shaped into someone who just loves to spend time with God. He He compares it to... Uh, an elementary student learning grammar 
who as an adult loves poetry mm. and it's, it's like he had no fun as an elementary student learning grammar, but it was because of that experience that as an adult, he was able just to delight in the way poetry shows beauty through language. Yeah. That's a great illustration. It is. I mean, if you're listening to this out there and you're going, well, there's a great juxtaposition in my life. There's a great tension between these two parts of my heart where I really want even to want to be a spirit filled person. But I don't even, in my heart of hearts, want that. You know, what I really yeah. want is the desires of the flesh, yeah. um, w- which is a place that we've all found ourselves in. And, and, and you know, that that is, again, it, time builds us into the people who want the things that God mm. wants. But what is the true heart we're really aiming for is the heart that naturally does desire the things of God. And that's hard work. It, it means that we are submitting to his spirit daily. It means we're spending time with him, asking, praying, repenting for the times where our hearts really desire the opposite of God's will and walking with him and saying, God, what does it look like for me to desire you more today? Put in my heart um, the desire for you and your word and your ways today. Cause, which is, you know, to bring it to the Lord's prayer, which is what we're asking for there. Your kingdom come, your will be done, not not mine, not but mine. your your will be done. Yeah, and I think even a lot of the ideas I've been uh, saying that are from C.S. Lewis actually come from another guy, George MacDonald. Um, and I, Jake just found the last time we did the podcast in here about a month ago, a book where it was C.S. Lewis had put together some of his favorite quotes from George MacDonald. And I've just been slowly reading through it over the last month, and it is incredible. Like he has lines specifically on dryness and not feeling the presence of the Lord that are just so good. So if you're looking for a good place to find encouragement, even about, man, I'm in a dry season. How do I deal with this? How do I work through this? I think George McDonald has been just an incredible person in my life in the last month to be like, Oh, this is okay. This is part of being a broken person who has built up habits of selfishness, who's built up habits of not loving the things of God, but that God has loved and saved and sent his spirit to live in and empower. It's just been so sweet to be able to have that. Yeah, I love that. We, you know, for anyone, again, who's listening, who's like, man, I've had fruitless time in the word i've had fruitless time of prayer Mm -hmm. one thing i always try to remember too is that they're called spiritual disciplines you know not Mm -hmm. not uh spiritual dessert or you know it's Mm -hmm. not it doesn't always taste sweet going down um but what is what else what is else requires discipline in life besides the spiritual disciplines Uh, let's think like exercise requires discipline getting up early requires discipline showing up on time to things that requires discipline being a reader that requires discipline these things initially feel awful you know exercising your body feels sore when you get back into it you feel unmotivated you don't see immediate results um getting up early you just feel more tired you hate the mornings there's nothing pleasurable about it initially and so that's kind of the nature of any discipline is at first and even throughout seasons still years down the road disciplines are uh, more of a willpower decision than than a heart felt decision but mm-hmm. it's the long-term consistency of these things that builds us into the people who look like god or even who look like they're disciplined you know yeah. but it's it's someone who works out for three years consistently who you say oh you go to the gym or you yeah. you are disciplined in your exercise schedule not the person who you know does it for two months really consistently and then stops um, me, which is me. <laughs> so it's a, it is like a it, it's an in some ways I just want to encourage someone who's feeling the weight of these disciplines out there to know that that's the reality of them is that they they can be really really hard and it is the consistency of coming back even when we don't feel gratified by it in the moment that um, that shapes us into people who are spiritually disciplined. Yeah, and I think even even just to take some of the edge off of it, like you don't have to start. Like no one has to start with the hour-long 
quiet time where they're praying and they got their prayer shawl. I don't even, I'm making up a, like we have this imaginary picture of what the superstar Christian looks like. And that's just not what Jesus commands of us. Like you don't, John Wesley says, uh, I think very little of a man who doesn't pray for three hours every day. Oh my gosh. (laughs) That's the picture. Cool. John. Yeah. That's, I'm thought very little of by John Wesley. <laughs> uh, this is why I like his brother Charles more. This is what you're saying is not the expectation. That's not the expectation. <laughs> I think what we're like expected to do is spend time with the Lord. And that can be so bite size. And I think even in that, we had a volunteer training recently, and it was so helpful in a lot of ways because he's talked about one of the things you can do is provide bite-sized opportunities for people to serve. And then they'll want to jump in more and more often is the case because ministry is addicting. Mm. And I think the thought I had is because, because loving God is addicting Mm. because it's actually what we're created for. And so to serve him in a way that actually does honor him and loves his people is going to be just delightful And I think that's just as true of the spiritual disciplines that I think starting with a bite size, like, okay, I can do this. This is something I can fit in my schedule. I can memorize one verse a week. I can, I can read a chapter a day. I can read even just a verse a day, like starting with something that's bite size. I think you'll find often it's addicting and you will just naturally start to want more. Yeah, well said. Well said. That's and and I think about uh, verse twenty three after the fruit of the spirit are listed. Against such things there is no law, mm-hmm. and it is this sense where when we are practicing the fruit of the spirit in our lives and walking in the ways of God, I I can't remember a single time in my life where I made a holy decision or where I made a decision to do something pleasing to God where I walked away and regretted that. You know, mm-hmm. I I I can I can think of hundreds of times where I've made a decision that's displeasing to God and it's made me pay and, and I've had consequences. I can't think of any time in my life where I've made the right decision and been like, ah, I wish I, I just wish I hadn't spent that time in the word with the Lord. Like, I, or I wish I just hadn't been in prayer with him yeah. there. You know, that's, there, there are no consequences to these things because they're rewarding and even mm-hmm. long term that they, they build reward that carries on into uh, it, you know god's not going to be a stranger to us when we come to heaven we don't get saved and then come to heaven and it's like well now, now i get to know jesus like, no you've been spending your life with him you mm-hmm. know him now and that's you get to reap the benefits of 80 100 years of being with him and then uh be with him forevermore mm. i think a brian hanneman once told me when i was in college that he never regretted obeying the word of God. And I think that was just, that was such a paradigm shift for me. Not even because I hadn't had the thought of like, Oh, it's good. It's good to obey the scripture. Like it's what God says. Get to do that. But just the idea of like never regretting decisions because they're just in line with who I am, with who God made me to be with who God is. And how the world actually works around me. That's so good. That's what I want. And I I think that's, that's the joy that comes in the fruit of the spirit. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. It's so, so true. I love, uh, love meditating on the spiritual disciplines with you, man. It's been so good. Jake, thanks so much for coming on. I like was so glad that you were the person I would get to talk to at the end of, my time hosting the weekly. So thanks for doing it, man. Absolutely. Anytime. Oh man. And so this again is the last weekly for the next couple months. Don't worry. The weekly will be back in August, late August, early September when Jay is back from sabbatical. Thanks for listening these last couple months and hope you have a great summer. We'll see you this week, Calvary.